Hi everyone, welcome to the first academic lecture of MD6028. So what I want to do in this session is establish some of the key uh, scientific concepts at the base of virology. So there's some things we need to understand straight away as we go into the virology module um, and that's what we're going to approach in this lecture. That's why this lecture is called What Are Viruses? Because the key um, kind of uh, principle we want to understand is what a virus is. So how do we define a virus? How do we distinguish between viruses and bacteria and all the other groups of microorganisms that you've learned about on your degree programme? So that's what we're going to talk about today. Okay, so again, what are viruses? That's the title of the talk today. We're going to look at the different ways we can define viruses and distinguish them from some of the other groups of microorganisms that we've talked about previously. So the first thing we want to bear in mind is that viruses are small. They're microscopic, which means technically they can't be seen with the naked eye. That's what microscopic means. Um, if we compare viruses to other microscopic uh, microorganisms, so if you compare them to bacteria, we will see viruses are much, much smaller. So bacteria are smaller than eukaryotic cells. So a bacteria is a prokaryotic cell, right? And a prokaryotic cell is a lot smaller than a eukaryotic cell. So one of our cells, for example, and viruses are generally smaller still. Now there's overlap on this scale. So the larger viruses are bigger than the smaller bacteria, but generally speaking, viruses are smaller than bacteria. So if you look up look, the giant viruses like mimi viruses that are bigger than a number of bacteria, but generally speaking, viruses are smaller than bacteria. And we see this reflected in the organization and structure of the viruses and the bacteria, which is something we'll talk about later. But if we look at the structure of a virus, we'll see it's a lot more simplistic than the cellular structure we see in bacteria. So again, it fits in with the idea that viruses are simpler and they're smaller. OK, if we want to have some idea of the kind of scale we're talking about when we're discussing these things, we have a human cell on the right. Again, it's labelled as an average human cell. I mean, it doesn't really mean much because humans have as I'm sure you know, a range of different cell types and these cells are in different shapes, they're in different sizes. So there is no single size for a eukaryotic cell because by nature, eukaryotic organisms are multicellular, well, humans are multicellular eukaryotic organisms. Um, so we have lots of different cells that are different shapes and sizes. But if we take the average human cell here, um, I think this is about 20 micrometers, and we compare it to E. coli, which is a pretty standard bacteria in terms of size, we can see eukaryotic cell is much, much larger. And then if we compare some viruses in there, we'll see viruses are smaller. So obviously not just smaller than the eukaryotic cell, but they're smaller than bacteria as well. But what we also see is the difference in scale is not necessarily as um, drastic as it is between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. So again, these viruses, when we're looking at the diameters for smallpox, you have 0.2 micrometers, 0.04 micrometers for HBV, which is hepatitis B virus. For HIV, it's 0.12 micrometers. Again, these aren't um, complete, they, these aren't hugely smaller than, for example, E. coli, which is 0.5 micrometers in diameter but they are smaller. So they're on the same scale, but they are smaller. And again, we've said how there are some exceptions and this is to be expected because as we've said, viruses are smaller than bacteria, but they're only a bit smaller sometimes. So it makes sense that the larger viruses would be larger than the smaller bacteria. There's something else we need to mention here, which is this idea of operating on scales. Um, so when we're talking about the sizes of microorganisms, uh, we're thinking about what units we want to use. So we're going to talk in millimeters, we're going to talk in micrometers, we're going to talk in nanometers. And generally, when we're talking about viruses, we make the switch to nanometers. Um, so when you see in research papers a particular virus um, having its diameter defined, you see the diameter is usually defined in nanometers. 
And again, the reason is because, as we can see from the examples we've got here, when we're talking about virus sizes, if we're sticking to the micrometer scale, so we're talking about micrometers, um, that's, those are the units we're using, um, we're operating right at the bottom of the scale to 0.2, 0.04, 0.12. Now, generally, as a rule in science, we don't tend to operate at the extremes of scales because things can get messy. You can end up with a lot of naught. It's actually hard to visualize numbers sometimes when there's a load of zeros there. So what we do when we're operating right at the bottom of the scale is we switch to the next um, type of unit we can use. So we switch from micrometers to nanometers in this case. So rather than saying HIV has a diameter of 0.12 micrometers, we usually say it has a diameter of 120 nanometers and the equivalent for HPV and smallpox as well. And the reason we do this is because then we're dealing with these nice big round numbers that are a bit easier to deal with. Um, even if we're talking about quite basic maths, it's easier to deal with whole numbers than 0.012, for example. If we don't understand the relationship between micrometers and millimeters and nanometers, this is something that we really need to um, do a little bit of reading on and make sure it's clear in your mind. So we're talking about um, a, a millimeter, and if we split a millimeter into thousands, each of those thousands is a micrometer. And if we split those micrometers each into a thousand, we get a thousand nanometers per micrometer. Um, so it's just times a thousand from millimeter to micrometer, then to nanometer. So again, if we are doing calculations to convert between the two, they're actually fairly straightforward because um, we're just times in by a thousand or divided by a thousand, depending which way we're going. Okay, so when we're thinking about what viruses are, so when we're trying to answer this question, what are viruses? Um, we can answer that question in a slightly different way as well. So in the last few slides, we kind of thought about what are they physically? What are they in terms of size? Um, now we can think about that question biologically. So what is the actual biological composition of a virus compared to a bacteria, compared to a human cell? And this is really, really important because if we look at biological composition, we see viruses are fundamentally completely different to bacteria. They're fundamentally completely different to any other form of life, really. Um, and again, this comes back to this crux issue that we're going to see again and again, which is whether or not viruses are actually alive, because they're completely fundamentally different to other forms of life. So whether viruses are actually alive is contentious, and we'll talk about that at some point. But all we need to worry about now is the fact that viruses um, are different biologically to cellular life forms, so to bacteria and to eukaryotic organisms and microorganisms. Um, I'm sure you know biologically what a bacteria um, looks like, um, what biological components make up a bacterial cell and also eukaryotic cells. So what biological components make up a eukaryotic cell? So for thinking about eukaryotic cells, you know, mitochondria, um, nucleus, um, Golgi, um, cell membrane, all things I know you've studied. For viruses, however, none of that really applies. Again, we're talking about something completely different. We're talking about something that is acellular, and this is a key term you'll see in the literature and you'll see used throughout the module. Viruses are acellular, so they're not composed of cells. They are not a cell. So a bacteria is a single cell. Virus is not a single cell. It's not cellular at all. That's why it's acellular. What we use um, to describe viruses is the term particle. So we say it's a virus particle. We'll never use the term virus cell. And again, the reason is because viruses are acellular. And if we look at the biological composition of the virus, we see that it lacks all of the fundamental components that define cellular forms of life. So the things we talked about, nucleus, um, in eukaryotic cells, nucleus, um, mitochondria, cell membrane, uh, th th these are not present in viruses and neither do viruses have any of the things that define um, bacteria. They don't have nucleoid, they don't have um, any of these 
components that you see in cellular life because they're not cellular. And what viruses are instead are, and this is a key term, they are essentially a nucleic acid genome wrapped in protein. And sometimes this protein, and we think this is a protein shell, is wrapped in a lipid envelope. So it's not a membrane, it's an envelope. Um, there's some distinctions between the two. Essentially, the virus envelope is inert. It's not active. It's not participating in processes in the same way that bacterial um, membranes are. It's simply a lipid, um, lipid coat that's surrounding the protein capsid. Okay, if we look at some of the different viruses that exist, and we can see a range of them here, um, variola virus, herpes virus, rabies, measles, HIV-1, SARS, um, adenovirus, um, Ebola virus. So we can see a real range of different structures. So we can see viruses can look very, very different. However, the key biological components are fundamentally the same. No matter the detailed structure of the virus, we always see a genome at the center, this genome being surrounded by some form of a protein coat, and then this protein coat sometimes being surrounded by an envelope. So what we'll see is viruses can be enveloped or unenveloped. Um, enveloped viruses do have this envelope surrounding the protein coat, um, but unenveloped viruses do not. Um, either way, clearly viruses are not cellular. These are not cellular structures. We're talking about acellular structures. Um, again, this composition, so this biological composition is a lot simpler than cellular composition. You don't have the organelles that you see in cells. You don't have a lot of the other fairly complex features that you see in cells. Viruses are just nucleic acid wrapped in protein, sometimes wrapped in lipid envelope, depending upon the type of virus we're talking about. Now, there's consequences to this. There's consequences to viruses being so simplistic. And this is the way they can exist, the way they can replicate, the way they produce energy. In short, viruses lack the ability to do any of these things themselves. They can't replicate themselves. They can't produce energy themselves because they don't have the machinery. They don't have the things they need. They don't have the components. And this is because they are so simple. So in cellular life forms, all of these components are present. Cellular life forms are able to produce energy. They're able to copy their DNA. They're able to replicate. Um, this isn't true for viruses. They're too simplistic. Uh, the only way viruses can make copies of themselves, so the only way um, viruses can produce progeny, is to infect cells. And this is um, the whole nature of viruses explained. Viruses are obligate parasites. Viruses can only successfully produce copies of themselves if they are infecting cells. And again, the reason is viruses don't have their own machinery. They don't have mitochondria. They don't have means to produce ATP. They don't have means to make new amino acids. They don't have means to do a lot of these really core um, processes. However, they can conduct these processes if they enter into another cell because what they're essentially doing is they're affecting a cell and then they're co-opting host cell machinery. So they're using the host cell machinery. And this is why we consider viruses obligate parasites. So viruses are obligated to parasitize. The only way viruses can make copies of themselves, the only way they can continue to exist is to enter into other cells and then use their machinery. So to manipulate these cells. And again, the reason they need to do this is because they don't have the machinery um, themselves. And this comes back to that issue we mentioned about whether or not viruses are dead um, or whether they're alive. Some people think viruses are dead. Some people think they're alive. Um, it kind of becomes a philosophical question at some point. Um, the best way to think of it from a biological point of view is that viruses have a living state and an inert state. So we don't, we don't really want to say dead because it's quite... Um, it's almost an emotive term, dead. Um, we just think of them as inert because when viruses are on their own, when a virus is just existing as particles, they exist in this inert state. They're not producing energy. They're not making copies of themselves. They're not undergoing any of the key processes that define life. However, once they enter into a host cell, then they start 
undergoing these processes because they are using host cell machinery, because they are co-opting the organelles that are present in cells. So in this state, they are considered alive. Again, some people um, see it slightly differently, but that's the best middle ground to walk down, and it's the one that makes the most sense biologically. Okay, and again, as we've just said, whether viruses are even alive remains a contentious question. I mean, there is a good argument that they're not alive because when they are on their own, they are just nucleic acid, just protein, sometimes wrapped in a lipid envelope as well. That's all they are. They can't make copies of themselves. They can't produce energy. They can't produce proteins. They can't replicate their genome. They can't really do anything at all. So they are entirely dependent upon the host cells um, they enter. But the alternative argument is when they enter into the host cells, then they do um, make copies of themselves, then they do engage in all the processes that define life. Um, yeah, so an interesting one. Some of those processes that I've been talking about, so some of these processes that define life, that viruses can't engage with on their own, but can engage with in host cells, are um, the ability to transcribe and translate proteins. So obviously this is key this is key to um, any life form producing progeny, so making copies of itself. It needs to make proteins, it needs to express its genome. Viruses can't do this unless they're in a host cell. Um, again, it needs to make copies of that genome. If the virus wishes to, um, I shouldn't say wishes, um, for a virus to make copies of itself to produce progeny, um, it needs to make copies of its genome to go into each of those progeny. And again, it can only do this within um, a host cell uh, for a virus to grow. So for a virus to, um, again, this is really tied to protein production, to make copies of itself, to make additional components. It can only do this in a host cell. And again, replicate and generate energy. So viruses, they, they can't produce their own ATP. So a lot of these processes require energy. Um, obviously viruses can't produce that energy, they can only do that when they're in a host cell. So really all these um, processes are reasons why viruses need to enter into a host cell, because that's the only place they can complete these processes. Okay, so hopefully we we'll find viruses biologically there. Again, just a, a straight up clear definition of what a virus is biologically is nucleic acid wrapped in protein, sometimes wrapped in a lipid envelope. Um, but when we establish that definition, we also need to go a step far, further like we just did and understand the implications of that definition. So we're defining viruses as being very, very simplistic, lacking all the organelles that we see in cellular life, in eukaryotic cells and lacking all the components that we see in um, prokaryotic cells as well. And the consequences of this is that viruses can't engage in a lot of biological processes unless they're in a host cell. And this means viruses are therefore obligate parasites. They can only produce progeny. They can only continue their own existence when they are infecting host cells. Okay. And this takes us on to the next way we want to define viruses. We want to, defi to define them with respect to human health. So if we want to think about viruses from the perspective of human health, how we can define viruses is we can say that they are infectious agents and they are causative agents of human disease. And what we mean by that is they are capable of infecting humans and when infecting humans, they are potentially capable of causing disease. Um, th this is intuitive, we know this anyway, but we want to explore it from a bit of a scientific perspective. Um, we can actually tie it back to what we've already talked about in terms of defining viruses biologically. So when we define them biologically, we said they are obligate parasites. So viruses are obligated to parasitize a host, to infect a host. And this is what viruses are doing when they're causing human disease. So if we're talking about um, the common cold, we're talking about um, rhinoviruses infecting epithelial cells in the respiratory tract um, where they cause disease. If we're talking about hepatitis B virus, we're talking about hepatitis B virus infecting hepatocytes where it causes 
um, cirrhosis and then uh, or causes hepatitis then it causes cirrhosis so it's causing liver damage we're talking about HIV we're talking about virus infecting um, immune cells so CD4 cells and ultimately causing depletion of these CD4 cells which causes immunodeficiency and so for the different viruses the details are different the way they infect is different um, yeah, the way they are infecting is different and the type of disease they cause is different but the key principles are the same every virus is an obligate parasite so every virus needs to infect a host and some viruses have evolved to infect human cells so some viruses have evolved to infect a human host whether it's um, again hepatitis b virus evolving to infect hepatocytes whether it's hiv evolving to infect cd4 cells whether it's rhinovirus uh, evolving to infect respiratory cells or epithelial cells the respiratory um, epithelial um, the principle is the same they need to infect these cells to make copies of themselves they need to infect these cells to make copies of themselves and this is where disease or infectious disease i should say ultimately comes from again we have these examples here we have rhinoviruses so most common colds are caused by rhinoviruses um, members of the family rhinoviridae um, also adenoviruses so a lot are caused by adenoviruses as well and what essentially happens is the virus enters into the host infects the cell type it preferentially infects produces copies of itself so produces the progeny we were talking about and then these progeny leave the host and infect a new individual and this is how disease spreads um, you'll have discussed in other modules this idea that we can split disease into non-communicable disease and communicable disease um, non-communicable disease this is disease like diabetes and inherited you know blood disorders and things like that so disease that can't be transmitted from person to person heart disease for example again um, you can't contract heart disease from another individual it's not contagious it's not transmissible um, the other type of human disease is communicable human disease and this is disease that can be passed from person to person or from person to environment to person so it can be transmitted horizontally through a population and the reason it can be transmitted horizontally is because it's caused by infectious agents it's caused by either bacteria or fungi or protozoa or crucially for this module viruses and again this is what's happening here viruses infecting a host um, it's making copies of itself it's producing progeny because again that's the only way a virus can produce progeny and then these progeny are then infecting either other cells in the individual or ultimately a new host and this is how the infectious disease is spreading throughout the population same is true for hiv so as we'll see we're talking about a different way that the virus enters into the host we're talking about different cell types being infected we're talking about a different way the virus leaves the host but the principle is exactly the same we have the virus needing to infect host cells to produce progeny and then when these progeny are produced we have the ability of these progeny so these virus copies to then infect a new host and then to continue to spread and this is infectious disease this is the key of how viruses are able to cause human disease okay so we can think a little bit more about defining viruses now um where are they this is a good question it's a bit of a strange thing to think about the fact that viruses um have so much of our research attention and we see the implications of viruses we see people ill with viral infections all the time obviously the last few years we've seen the implications um at population level and worldwide level of viral illness however we've never actually seen a virus itself right and again the reason is because they're microscopic because they're um, not observable by the naked eye however we can be assured that they are everywhere so we have some statistics here um, I don't really like big statistics like this because they're a bit hard to grasp but I think in this case that they do the job and essentially the point I'm trying to make is that there are a huge number of viruses an unimaginable number of viruses that are ubiquitous across earth they're everywhere basically so this is a summary of the ways in which we've defined viruses today 
So first off, we said viruses are small. We think about them on the nanometer scale. Again, you remember the nanometer scale we were talking about at the start of the lecture. If it's not, if it's not intuitive to you, if it's not really clear, um, I'd encourage you to do a little bit of reading around about nanometers and micrometers and things like that. Even aside from biology, it's an important um, aspect of science to understand because in any lab job, when you're talking about units of volume of any research position, um, when we're talking about units of volume, um, we're talking about microliters and nanoliters. Um, so it, it, it's essentially the same, when we're, but we're just talking about volume instead of size. Um, so it's really useful to understand these conversions. Next, we said viruses are distinct from eukaryotic and prokaryotic life. So eukaryotic life and prokaryotic life, both are forms of cellular life. And as we've established, viruses are not cellular, they're acellular. It's really, really important we understand this because when we actually look at what the structure of virus is, which is what we did next, we said a virus is just a nucleic acid wrapped in protein, sometimes wrapped in an envelope. This is the biological um, constitution of a virus. This is what a virus is biologically. So we can clearly see it's not a virus, it's not a cell. So it's nothing like a eukaryotic cell, it's nothing like a prokaryotic cell. It is a virus particle. And there are clear implications of this that are really, really important to our understanding of viruses. So the implication of viruses being so simplistic of being acellular is that viruses can only produce progeny. So they can only continue to exist as obligate parasites. So they can only continue to exist by infecting host cells. This is how they produce progeny. And this really, really matters. It's really important that we understand this because this ability of viruses to infect host cells, this necessity for viruses to infect host cells really is directly tied to their ability to cause disease. Because this is how they cause disease. They cause disease by infecting cells within a host and then causing disease within the host by this process. So the examples we looked at, we looked at um, three examples today, hepatitis B virus infecting hepatocytes, um, rhinoviruses infecting epithelial cells of the respiratory tract and causing the common cold, um, human immunodeficiency viruses infecting CD4 cells of the immune system. So again, this, and then causing immunodeficiency. So the ability of viruses to cause human disease is directly tied to their necessity to infect um, cells, um, host cells. Okay, and again, this is why we define them as infectious agents. Um, and finally, viruses are everywhere. So we just touched on the idea that viruses are ubiquitous. Um, and it's just as long as we understand that. Okay. Next, we want to think a bit more about virus structure. Um, so what we specifically want to talk about here are the three different general structures that viruses can have. So we've talked about the organization of viruses in terms of the biological organization, what are they composed of? Um, but now we want to think about the structure. And really, when we're talking about structure, we're talking about the capsid shape. Um, the capsid is the protein shell that we talked about that wraps around the viral uh, genome. So you have the nucleic acid, which is the viral genome, and it's wrapped around by a protein shell. So the genome and then the shell is wrapped around it. Um, this shell, sometimes we refer to it as a capsid. It's basically a protein structure that encloses the genome. Now the capsid can come in various shapes, um, but there are three main shapes that we need to really understand that we see over and over again. And virus capsids are, are, tend to be variations of these shapes. Again, this is a diagram showing what we're talking about here. We're talking about the protein capsids. So we're talking about this protein shell that is surrounding the viral genome. And if we remember, some viruses will also have an envelope that surrounds this protein capsid. Not all, but some will. So the three shapes that we see capsids assemble into are helical, icosahedral and complex. Now, one thing we need to bear in mind when we're talking about these capsids is that they're often composed of repeating subunits. So for various reasons, which we'll discuss in the module, it benefits viruses to have small 
genomes. So that means they're very, very efficient at utilizing the genes they have because it minimizes the number of genes they have to carry, therefore minimizes the size their genome has to be. They don't need a large genome if they're very, very efficient in how they utilize their small genome. And one sign of this efficiency is the fact that viruses have capsids that are composed of repeating subunits again. So they're composed of proteins, um, protein copies, so the same, so copies of the same protein used over and over again. And one way these proteins can assemble into a capsid is by assembling into a sort of spiral. So this helical shape in which the nucleic acid is winding around the center and the capsid proteins are attached to the outside filling in this spiral and ultimately they therefore exist in this elongated helical shape and this is one of the types of virus capsid that we see. Another viral structure that we often see is the icosahedral structure so many viruses have an icosahedral capsid. Um, we can see this demonstrated on the slide and when we're thinking about the icosahedral structure we're thinking about a structure that seems spherical but actually when we look at it in more detail it's actually composed of these flattened surfaces and these flattened surfaces are triangles and often what we see is each of these triangular surfaces is identical to the other and this fits in with the idea that we've discussed that viruses have evolved to produce capsids from the same protein so copies of the same protein assembling together and what we will see um, in many viruses is when we look at each of these individual triangular subunits they're identical to each other so each triangle here is identical to the next triangle um, because it's been assembled from a very small number of proteins sometimes as few as three proteins so just three genes can assemble and um, can be expressed and then the proteins can assemble into these quite complex capsid shapes. So something else we can identify here is the fact that we can see there's three different axes of symmetry and this is just a defining feature of the icosahedral shape. So if we look at the structure from different angles we can identify these specific three axes of symmetry. We can see in A along this axis there's twofold symmetry. So the um, structure can be partially rotated twice and maintain symmetry. Um, in section B we can see along this axis the structure can be partially rotated three times and maintain symmetry. So that's threefold symmetry. And in section B, uh, sorry, in section C, we can see this is fivefold symmetry. So along this axis, the structure can be rotated five times and each time maintain this symmetry. So essentially look the same. And again, as we've said, this structure um, is part of what enables viruses to maintain such a tight, efficient, minimalistic genome. Because the most simple viruses that use this structure, they will have each um, triangular face composed of three subunits. And in the most simple icosahedral shape, um, only 20 triangular faces are utilized. So that means overall, for the entire capsid, only 60 proteins are needed. And of these 60 proteins, they're copies of three single genes. So three single genes are ex expressed to produce 60 proteins overall. Um, and of those 60 proteins, 20 are identical to each other, another 20 are, are identical to each other, and another 20 are identical to each other. So again, this capsid, which could easily be very complex, is actually very, very simple because of this strategy that the viruses have utilized. Um, as I indicated earlier, we'll talk about why it's useful for viruses to maintain a small genome. And when we're talking, when we're saying useful, what we're really saying is there's an evolutionary advantage, so there's a selective advantage. Um, I'll mention one clear reason now, which is when we're talking about the immune response to viral infection, we'll see that the immune system detects viral genomes. Um, very effectively. So viral genomes are often different to host cell genomes in some very specific ways and our immune system has evolved to detect those specific differences. So if a virus is able to maintain a small genome it lowers the likelihood 
that the genome will be detected by the host cell, so it minimizes the immune response. So that's just an, an example of why it's beneficial for viruses to maintain a small genome. And on the slide, this is an example of one of the ways in which viruses do maintain that small genome. Finally, we have the complex structures. So we have three examples here. Each of these examples is a type of bacteriophage. Now you may have heard of bacteriophages, Bacteriophages are essentially viruses that infect bacterial cells. So they're viruses that have specially evolved to infect um, prokaryotic cells. Quite distinct structure. We can see the capsid head at the top, and they also have this long body, this tail. Um, so yeah, a little bit niche, but it is really, really important we understand these because as we'll see later in the module, bacteriophages have a really important role in human health. Um, just because they don't actually infect human cells, so they don't use humans as hosts, it definitely doesn't mean they're not important because by infecting bacteria, bacteriophages have a knock-on effect on human health, which we'll talk about. Okay, um, finally, very briefly, I'm going to talk um, about viral replication. Now, it's really just this single slide because I want to make you aware of something called the viral replication cycle. Now, you'll have discussed it previously in modules. I just want to make sure that at this point you have the opportunity to revise that information. So a lot of what we talk about is going to be going into detail on this viral replication cycle. So it's really, really important you understand it. I have a version of it here. There's a you know countless diagrams of this online looking at all the different stages so please do go out there find a diagram that works for you that you find intuitive and study it and make sure you understand it um, i'm introducing it in this what are viruses lecture because this is a real key important aspect of how viruses replicate and clearly as you can see it's completely different to how cellular life forms replicate it's specific to viruses and it's really, really important you understand it for this module. What we're essentially seeing is the virus is entering into the host cell, then it's replicating, making copies of itself, and then these copies are leaving the host cell and where they can then go and infect new host cells or they can infect a new host. So that's a very simplistic version of it. When we actually look at it in more detail, we will see the nuances, we'll see the details. And it's really important we understand those nuances and details because antiviral drugs target this um, whole process. So they target stages of the viral replication cycle. So really important we understand it and we'll look at that in detail in the module. Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks for listening to the lecture today and I'll speak to you soon. Take care.